been crazy and wild sometimes. And when kids are in here, it gets even crazier and stranger. Because did you know that we were not born knowing how to worship? You think we would be, but we, we really weren't. And so, you know, we, we have just, as when we started the church, we just decided we were going to be an equipping church. You know, that's what God said to us. And we had a lot of people who wouldn't come to our church because we didn't have a dump-off place for our kids. Is that crazy? We didn't, because people want to dump their kids and come in and not have to think about it or worry about it. And, and that's great for, for if that's the mandate on your, your life. But we just felt like it's an equipping and it's a family and it's a, it's a kingdom thing. And so it's okay when worship gets a little rowdy and a little different. And, you know, you know, connect your kids with some worshipers. If you need some help, some of us have been worshiping a long time. You know, help them out. This is how we as a family train and love our children and bring them up into the kingdom of God. You keep them in the presence of God. I mean, my, my favorite thing is to watch my granddaughter, who's one year old, doesn't really know, but when worship starts, she raises her hand. You know why? Because we do. You keep them in the presence of God, and that will be, you know, just commonplace. And so if it's loud and it's, it, it, you know, training is messy. Family is messy, and that's okay. This is training ground. So, you know, feel free. Go for it. We'll, we all do it together. Amen? Amen. All right. So, announcements. One, a lot of you are asking about my dad, and he's doing well today. Um, they've done all kinds of tests. He's been in the hospital since... New Year's Eve, midnight, we started the year with a bang. You know, Joy and my dad both, my sister and my dad both were in the ER. Midnight, New Year's Eve, Joy's doing better. She's increasing in health. Amen. Amen. And I believe my dad is too. He, he's lost a ton of blood and he's had a blood transfusion and they cannot find the source of the bleeding. It's just something strange. We don't know. So they just had, the doctors just came by. Mom just sent me a message that the camera test that they did yesterday showed nothing. So, <laughs> so anyway, he's feeling, he's feeling good, though, and I think he's just ready to go home. Mom's ready to go home. Um, so just continue to pray. I don't know what's going to happen, what they're going to decide today, if they're going to let him go home or they're going to say we're going to do some more tests or, you know, we don't know. So, but thank you guys for praying when you did begin to pray, and I put it out there because we were just kind of waiting to see what, what was going to happen, so I didn't put out a lot of information out there, but when I did put some information out on Facebook, you guys began to pray, and things began to shift for him. So thank you very much. <coughs> Prayer is a powerful thing. Um, we go back to school tomorrow? <laughs> Woo! Uh, <laughs> no, I'm ready. I, I'm ready to see them. Parents are parents are most ready, right, James? <laughs> and um, Supernatural School starts back up tomorrow, and this month is School of Deliverance, so get all your demons dealt with so you can help deal with other people's. Amen? Yeah, if you do quit coming this month, it does look bad. Yeah. If you show up, I don't know if it looks worse. I, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, we all need more layers of freedom, right? Amen. And it's it's really difficult to help set others free when we are not free. So if we're going to be an equipping church, we have to be equipped and trained so that we can do the works of Jesus, right? Amen. So Ziggy, Chan Ziggy Sanchez will be here Monday night, January 20th. So that's two weeks from tomorrow. So that we'll talk a little bit more about that next week maybe. So I think that's it. Right? All right, praise God. Now let's take an offering and uh, let's stand together as we prepare to do that. So thank you for uh, your faithfulness in giving and uh, we're going to make our offering declaration. Uh, we don't pass a plate after we make the declaration. Um, if you have an offering, you can give it to bring it to the chest up here in offering and worship. If you want to give online, and I know many people do that, you can go to Global Harvest Church dot co and give online and if you do want to give cash giving there's an envelope at the back if you want us to keep record of that so let's just make this declaration over our finances today 
Heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declaration, impartation, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions to go to the nations. Souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revival. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven to see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen. So we just give in faith, trusting God, knowing that he is faithful, and that he cares for us, that he gives us our daily bread. Amen. So praise God. Thank you for your giving. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's good. Amen. All right. Now, at this time, uh, we'll dismiss the kids to go to their programs. Amen. And as they go, just to nursery up through sixth grade. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And it goes without saying that we need to be praying for our nation at this moment. Uh, I don't watch a lot of news um, for many reasons, but, uh, but be praying for our government, the nations of the earth. There are many things that could be said, and, uh, but we just need to pray for great wisdom and that God would do what he wants to do and that we and our governments and the nations of the earth would all have great wisdom and understanding. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, I want to continue, and, and we started this last week, but uh, I just, last week, we, our, our, the title of the message, it was Preparing for a Decade of Harvest, amen, and that was the, the first part of this message. This is obviously the second part, part two, and uh, many people are declaring that we are entering in the, as the church as the most, our most fruitful decade yet. I really believe that. I mean, now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the most tiptoe through the tulips decade we've ever had, right? And, uh, you know, there, there's much warfare in the earth. There's many prayers that need to be prayed. Um, I know, you know, I don't know what all uh, the Lord's saying at this moment about what's happening. That's really not my message. Uh, I do know that many times when um, there is a great awakening upon us that things get stirred up in the nations, right? And so uh, we need to pray that God would do what he wants to do. But uh, one of the words that God spoke through Charlie Champ to us, that as a church, this would be our most fruitful decade yet, and that we are a house of deliverance and revival. Now, last, uh, last uh, Sunday, I talked about deliverance and what that looks like. Um, obviously, this month in Supernatural School, it is our school of deliverance, and uh, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting school. It always is. Um, I've had people from the community contact me saying they plan on coming. I think there's a great hunger for freedom, and if we're really going to be the church that Jesus has called us to be, we've got to get free, right? And I think you know, we're going to see that as I go through this message today. Um, you know, one thing that I want to talk about is, and we're, we're going to look again. Last week, we looked at some of the prophetic words that were given. I'm going to dissect, again, another set of prophetic words that were given to us and kind of go through line by line. Everybody wants to know what God's saying for 2020, right? But I want to caution you when we do this. A lot of times people just want to hear a word of the Lord and think, well, that's great. But when we have prophetic words, we have to lay a hold of them. We have to obey them, right? And we have to believe those things into manifestation, all right? So as I'm putting these things out today, there'll be a lot of amen, hallelujah, that's awesome. But there's a practicality that we have to follow what God says, Right, and that's an important component. And also another thing that, as as and some of you guys have been here a long time, you understand this. 
But there's a reality, too, that um, how we do church in the United States has to change. It has to change. And uh, I have a definition here. There are a lot of terms that, you know, prophets and apostolic people are putting out there, like apostolic sinners, which is a term I like. I haven't put it on our billboard because everybody thinks we're crazy enough. <laughs> Right. If we said that we're the apostolic center of Ardmore, people would be like, who do you think you are? And there are terms like revival hubs that people are putting out there, freedom centers, kingdom centers. And those are all good. I just like going with we're a church, right? And, but we ha that means we have to get back to what the concept of the church was originally supposed to look like and not what we've seen it morph into in America, Okay, and so I do have a definition here that I want to read before I go into talking about this today uh, because God is restoring the concept of what the church is to look like, amen. So here's a definition from, it's actually written by Ryan Lestrange and Jennifer LeClaire, and it says, the vision is not merely to build a ministry that blesses people, but to release the spiritual destiny of a city or region, host the presence of God, and facilitate a radical transformation in hearts and minds that ultimately changes the spiritual climate. Okay? So our assignment, we could gather and we could bless people, and that'd be awesome. Right? But in time, that won't produce anything in a region. Okay? When we begin to lay a hold of God's plans and purposes for a city, for a region, and say, God, we're going to partner with you to see your plans and purposes come to, to actually change the thinking and mindset of people through teaching and training. And ultimately, we have to be people that host the presence of God, yeah. right? And that's what the church was called to do, amen? And so we're laying hold of that. And part of laying hold of that is saying, okay, God, this is what you've said, and we're laying a hold of your word, and we're believing that into manifestation. Amen. And so that's what today's service is about, right? It's always kind of risky, I feel, when we do services that we're saying, okay, this is what God has said, and let's lay hold of it, and we do it. Because it, it's dependent not only upon myself and Jamie and the leadership, but it's dependent upon all of us as a body of believers to say, we're part of the army of the Lord laying hold and taking hold of those promises and actively pursuing them. Amen. Now, before I go into, and I want to look at a lot of words from Abner Suarez. And many of you obviously were here when Abner was with us in November of the past year on a Sunday morning. But then Abner gave some very, very, very specific and strategic words for us as a church on Monday night of Supernatural School. Many of you heard that. Many of you didn't. So I want to highlight some of those things that the Lord said and that He wants to do in this year. Amen. Now also I want to remind you of a prophetic word that Charlie Champ gave us again last year that over the coming year there would be three waves that would hit the church. Amen. And that each wave, and each wave would be a wave of revival and awakening that would hit the church, this church. And that um, each wave would get stronger than the last. Okay, Now that sounds wonderful when we say amen, but we have to be actively believing and asking and partaking of what God wants to do. Seeing that come in. Amen. And so that's one of the things that Charlie said. He also said that we were to write our name in the book of revival, right? And many of us on those meetings, we actively, and in the spirit, we did that. There was a book of revival that opened up, and Charlie said, I see people in this place that uh, their names will be written in history books of revival, amen? And so I know many of us were like, God, we're writing our name in the book of revival. And I'm reminding you that we as a church wrote our name in the book of revival. Amen. And that God's actively wanting to do that and produce a, that in us. Amen. So now let's jump into some of the words that Abner said. Obviously, we're going to have communion. 
in just a few moments, which is what we always try to do on the first Sunday of, of every month. But one of the first things that Abner said in November in, in that meeting was he said, um, I see an angel in this place holding a scroll. And on that scroll, on the back of it, it says, the city of Ardmore. Okay. And the word was, the Lord is offering you a blueprint to disciple this city. And that you have a mandate to change this city. And also, I want you to fill this city with the doctrine of Jesus. Now, that's not just our mandate. Right, There are other churches. There are many other churches in Ardmore, right? And we all have a mandate, okay? But if God says to us, you have a mandate to change a city, I I take that to heart. I listen to what the Lord says, and I want to lay a hold of it, partner with the Lord, and walk in it. Amen? Now, many of you know that years ago, it's probably been about seven years ago, I had a series of dreams um, that all revolved around Bill and Benny Johnson, I'm not going to go back through all those dreams again, but the third dream that I had, and often when, when God wants to give me an impartation in my life personally or an impartation for the church, a, minister, a well-known minister shows up in my dream, and they give me something, they do something, they tell me something that's common, right? Just a few weeks ago, I had a dream that I was riding with Chuck Pierce in a convertible going to an international prayer meeting. Right, which is very interesting. Those things are all very prophetic and very specific. And my friend Tom Ledbetter said it means that um, what you're doing can't be hidden anymore. It's out in the open. Amen. And that, so I've had many dreams over the last days. It's interesting. A few what a month ago I taught on dreams, and many of us have been dreaming like crazy since that moment. But the dream I had in the third in the, the third in a series of dreams, Bill Johnson walked up to me. And he handed me an, a stack of papers, books, and architectural drawings and blueprints. And he said, these are yours. Amen. And from that moment, I knew that God was further. We'd already felt it, but, we, but God was giving us a mandate to change a city and to bring transformation to a city. So I was not surprised when Abner gave us that word that there's that angel with that scroll that says City of Ardmore, and he's giving us a mandate to change a city. Now, that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? But how? what kind of strategy do we need to change a city? Because we can get those words, and we can say, well, that's really exciting, and never do anything about it, right? Because when God gives us prophetic words through his servants and through his prophets, Right, the word says. Now there are times that even in, there's a whole teaching. Sometimes it's not the time. Sometimes it's not the season. Uh, we have to believe though. I mean, Abraham had promises that took him decades to see come into manifestation. Right, but there there's an agreement. We have to believe the Lord and His prophets, and we will prosper. Amen. And so, but so I, when God says stuff like that, I'm like, God, how? How do we fulfill that mandate, okay? And I believe one of the things that we obviously have to do is look at Scripture, right? And uh, so I want to turn this morning. This is a familiar Scripture. I read it often, but Acts 19. And as you're turning there, um, even as Abner was prophesying to us, uh, he said, you know, that one of the models of how Jesus began to change a city was that he would go in and he would find a small group of people and, um, and Jesus would find those who would walk with him. And it generally started with a small group, right? But then it would grow and that Jesus, he had a group of, he had the 12, obviously, that he called, right? But even in the 12, there was also three, Right, that were in inner circle, and then there was also a group of seventy that he would send out, and then there were the the from those places that that God would grow. But it it usually began when God would want to teach and train a city, He would find a group, a small group, that was willing to walk with Him, right? And so we see that in Acts nineteen. So I want to turn there. 
Let's just start reading in verse 1. And it came about that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now, Paul obviously goes to Ephesus, which at that time was a very, very, very dark city, right? It, you know, everybody says, oh, our city's the worst, right? Uh, but that was very true about Ephesus. It was a very, very pagan city. It was a center of idolatry in the earth. There was lots of witchcraft. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And so how do you penetrate a city that is captivated by darkness and idolatry, right? And so it says that he, um, he found these disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. They were an evangelical church, <laughs> right? I can joke about that because I have a Baptist background, right? And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men. So Paul finds a small group into which he can bring the kingdom, right? They've heard about Jesus. They've got a measure of revelation. But Paul says, hey, there's more. Let me lead you into more. Let me bring you into this kingdom dimension. It's awesome that you were baptized in water. Let's get you baptized in the Spirit, right? Start praying in tongues, right? You guys, God's not finished with praying in tongues, right? It's still a very, very important part of our lives, and I want to encourage you in this new year, right? Um, pray in tongues. It's an important exercise. It's an important discipline, and it will stir up and further connect you to what the Lord is doing, and if you can't pray in tongues, well, we can get you praying in tongues, Amen. It's not a hard thing. So, but he also had them prophesying. Right? When they got baptized in the Spirit, not only did they pray in tongues, they began to prophesy and to declare the word of the Lord. So there's this greater kingdom dimension that suddenly starts coming into a small group in Ephesus. And that's how the Lord has always worked. Right? And then what happens? Paul goes to the synagogue. Right? And it says in verse 8, and he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading with them about the kingdom of God. But when some were, you know, it makes sense because God, Paul first, God, there's an order in God. And there's this group of people, though they didn't have the full revelation about Jesus, they had an understanding because God had brought understanding to a people group that he was bringing the kingdom to and through. And so Paul would go to those who at least had an idea who God was, right? And he, he all, would always do that in every city that he went to, and he went looking for disciples. And so he went to the synagogue, and he starts introducing this to them. And it says in verse 9, But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them and took his way his disciples. So Paul finds a group in the synagogue, and as often happened wherever Paul went, right, stuff started getting stirred up against him. It was a religious spirit. I believe that was the thorn in Paul's flesh. There was a religious demon that continually followed Paul and stirred up adversity against him, right? And so, you know, there's a group that rises up, and Paul says, okay, awesome, I've got this group of disciples, I found these 12 men. I found this group in the synagogue. We're going we're gonna to build kingdom. We're going to build the church in the city of Ephesus. Amen. And it, he says he, he began to reason daily in the school of Tyrannus. Right? Not only did Paul establish church, right, but he established an equipping center. Right? And every day in the school of Tyrannus, 
he began to teach and train. And it says, and this took place for two years, right? So that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. When God wants to begin to penetrate a city or a region, he looks for a people, right? And it's generally a small group, right? But then it begins to multiply, and it begins to grow, and it begins to penetrate. That's one of the reasons I believe strategically that the Lord told us years ago to establish a supernatural school, right? Because what we can do in a supernatural school far exceeds what we can do on a Sunday morning. That's just the reality of it, right? I love what God does on Sunday mornings, but when he can do more in a supernatural school, amen. So that's the model that Paul began to use. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's filling our Jerusalem with teaching. I'm very encouraged that I've had people from, and our supernatural school has always been structured for people to come to, out of the community and can come to be a part of what we're doing. Amen. And that's what we want. We don't want to say, this is just global harvest. And some people are contacting me saying, hey, we want to come to your deliverance school, which is a good thing. Amen. Because there are a lot of demons that need to be cast out of Ardmore. We all have some junk that we need to get free from. Right? Not only that, we all need to get equipped to set people free. Right? One thing that's very interesting is if you look at revival... Okay, um, the Argentinian revival, which had a strong deliverance component, right, lasted 17 years. Okay, um, the Welsh revival, which did not have a strong deliverance component, lasted a year. Azusa Street, which did not have a strong deliverance component, lasted three years. Okay, so if we want to see long-term revival and awakening in a city, you have to have an aspect and a component of deliverance, right? Not to be spooky, scary, but there's the reality of that we all need to get free. We all have areas of woundedness in our lives that we need to get healed from, amen? And God wants to do that in all of us. So deliverance ministry is a very important component of revival and awakening long term. A second part of the word that Abner said to us, he said, this is a house of miracles. Amen. Hallelujah. And he said, God wants to give this house grace for unusual miracles. Okay. Um, and, and when Abner was ministering that night, he, he saw a healing angel in this room. Okay, now, I think that angel stays here, right? I think he's resident here. I think there are other angels that are resident in this place. And don't freak out when I start talking about stuff like that. Read through the words sometime and see how many angels showed up, right? And, and how many people encountered angels and angels. Now, we're not worshiping angels, obviously not, but they are sent to help the workers of salva salvation, workers in the body of Christ to facilitate the move of God. And so I believe there's also an angel of awakening here. And others have prophesied about it. Others have seen it. There's an angel of awakening that stands in this property, not only to guard what God is doing, but as a, a, a beachhead and as a place of which God is wanting to send out um, revival and awakening into a city and a region. Now, I believe there are probably other angels of awakening at other churches, so don't think that I'm just get, got the big head. Right? But I know there are specific things here and specific spiritual beings here that we're partnering with to see things come. So there's an, there is a healing angel in this room. And the thing is, when God says, I want to give this church unusual miracles, and the word Abner said was that this is not just for the leadership, but this is for everyone. Right? We, we've got to understand that it's, and you guys have an understanding of that, but I just want to reaffirm that it's not just the Bill Johnsons, the Heidi Bakers, 
um, the Robbie Dawkins, uh, the Benny Hens, all those people that are supposed to be doing the works. We're all, this is the day of the saints, right? The, the whole purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, right? And the work of ministry, that, that's a big, that's a lot, but one big part of it is ultimately, I think that ultimately speaks of doing the works that Jesus did, right? We're all called to do that. And so God's wanting to give, and we've seen some unusual miracles over the years, right? I want to see more. Right? I want to press into more. I believe that, that even some of the challenges that we've experienced and, and some of the things that have come against us is there's an invitation for all of us to move into the greater works and to move into those greater dimensions. And, uh, you know, so I want to continue reading in, you know, Acts 19. We were just there, but uh, let's skip down to verse 11. It says, And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that hanker, don't you love that so much is happening in Ephesus, one of the darkest cities in the earth, the kingdom starts penetrating it, uh, everybody starts getting saved, right? And so much, there's so much miraculous happening that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, has to distinguish between ordinary miracles and unusual miracles. Right? Unusual miracles start happening. Right? And it says, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. So one of the unusual miracles is that God's anointing handkerchiefs and cloths and aprons and that they're taking them and they're putting them on people and people are getting healed and they're getting delivered from demons. Right? Which was one of the prophetic words that that would happen in this house, which is why I pulled out some of the handkerchiefs in my office again this morning. Because I want them to get saturated with the presence and the anointing and the glory that, that is resident in this place, and not only in this place, but in this place, in us as the body of Christ. Amen. So I'm just believing that the, you know, we may need to send one of those to your dad. I don't know. Right? But, but the, why, why is it that Paul began to experience unusual miracles? I, I believe that it's because in addition to a church Paul was very strategic about placing an equipping center in a training center. And what happens when you start training and equipping people to move in the miraculous? It starts breaking out, right? Because it's not just Paul that's doing the stuff. One of the things that John Wimber began to say when he began to teach about the kingdom and, and miracles and healing was that um, we all get to play. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. That sounds a little bit disrespectful. Okay, whatever. We'll do the stuff. Yeah. Right? Uh, you don't have to have a mandate from me to go and heal the sick. You have a mandate from the Word. Right? You have a call and a commission from Jesus and from the Word of God to begin to do those things. And begin to move in that. And I, but I believe that there was a level of, of, of greater uh, miraculous things that begin to happen because of that training and equipping center. Amen. Um, now it, it, it still freaks me out that one of the words that Charlie Shamp gave to me was that one of my apostolic signs would be the healing of cancer. Amen. Right. And, and, and I'm, I'm contending for that. Right. But, but the word that Abner gave was that this word about unusual miracles wasn't just for the leadership, but it was for all of us, right? Now, that sounds really exciting, but it requires some risk on our part. I mean, Damon and Christy were telling me about praying for people in Dallas at the shopping mall. Awesome. 
that's so awesome that they were seeing things happen. They prayed for a, a Syrian guy that um, hurt his leg ice skating, right? Um, they're, they're, you know, they, they're like, okay, let's just, let's just bring kingdom wherever we are. Even if it's in the Galleria, right? The Galleria needs it, <laughs> right? I was there on Christmas one time, and those people need to get saved, right? <laughs> you know, and one of the things that God said, and I brought this out last week through Charlie Champ, was that, that God was adding a weight of responsibility to us because of the call of God on this church, right? Now, again, that's one of those things that everybody wants to say, woo, hallelujah, but that means there is a cost to breakthrough. There's a cost to breakthrough, right? And, and that means that every one of us, from the leadership to the kids and children's church, we have a call and a weight of responsibility to enter into the greater things that Jesus wants us to begin to move in. And sometimes it's just as simple as risking praying for a Syrian guy at the ice skating rink at Galleria. How weird is that? Right? We've got to begin to move in those things. We, that means we can't live as everybody else lives. And this week, as I, as I have pondered on some of these words and some of the things that the Lord said prophetically, and many of them are words that we've got in the past, and there are moments that I've been really encouraged, and there are moments that have been like, oh God, how do we do some of these things, right? So that was the second. First was that... Um, the, the uh, discipling a city. The second is that we're to be a house of miracles. Now, another strategy that Abner gave us for, for prophetically was that he said to identify the prophets in this place, identify the seers, right? Identify the intercessors and the worshipers and bring them together. Okay, we've got a lot of prophetic people in this house, right? Because prophetic people just got to be somewhere crazy, right? That's okay. And some prophetic people who haven't understood who they were or their gift, right, or have even maybe been hurt because they've been in places that didn't understand their gift are, are coming and experiencing what it means to be in a house of prophets, Right now, this is more than a house of prophets. There are many gifts here, right? But there's something about God is wanting to gather people because there there's a move of prayer and intercession, and I believe intercession is very very important at this moment. Oh my gosh, do you feel the weight of it, of what's just even happening in the earth right now? Right there's there's so much of a weight of intercession. That, that's coming on the body of Christ. And, you know, and, I, and again, I, I don't totally know what God's saying about all of this. But remember when 9-11 hit? Some of you weren't born yet, or you were really young. But do you guys remember? I remember that that night, or it was the night after, our church in Shawnee had an impromptu prayer meeting. Our church was packed. People who didn't always make it on Sunday morning, they came because why? They were scared. You know, and our, our Congress all stood together and sang, God bless America. Right? And then in about a month, two months, three months, it was all back to normal. One of the reasons that Argentina had a revival was because of, uh, I believe it was the war, the Falklands, and they had a submarine that sank or something like that, and it, had, it igni and I don't want ever to think that we have to go into a, a difficult times for a, a revival to ignite, 
But the Argentinian revival partially fired off because the nation experienced great mourning and loss. And it provoked a realization that there was something they were lacking as a nation. And there was a spiritual void and they began to cry out. I believe there's a call for America to realize what we're lacking and begin to cry out to the Lord. This is a very strategic year for intercession, amen. And so there's got to be this gathering of the intercessors, the prophets, the worshipers, and the seers. And before you sit back and say, well, I'm none of those, yes, you are. Right? We're all called to be worshipers. We're all called to be intercessors, right? And so they're, they're, I don't know how God's going to do this, and part of the word was that he was giving me apostolic grace to legislate the words given, right? And that he saw me, Abner said, I see the Lord giving you a, a staff like Moses had, amen, right? Maybe I'll start carrying a staff, I don't know. There are enough rumors, right? And, uh, but part of the word was, I see that you're an apostle to Ardmore, you're an apostle to Oklahoma, you're an apostle to the nations, and there's something that God is giving us apostolically to legislate some of these words that we're giving. We're getting because I get these things. I'm like, God, how are we going to do this? Do you know how hard it is to get a consistent prayer meeting going? Because there's such resistance to it. There's resistance to prayer and worship that transforms the city, right? You have a prophet come in, everybody shows up. Everybody wants a word. You have a prayer meeting, how many people show up, right? Because prayer and intercession will transform things, amen? And so one of the things that I've really tried to do is I've orchestrated a guess that we have in this year, uh, and I find that sometimes the Lord just does this, I, I, that God's bringing some very key ministries of intercession, prayer, seers, prophets. The God's doing that. Now, in February, we'll have Ian and probably his wife, Rachel, Carol with us, and um, they'll be with us over the course of a weekend. Um, Ian is an Irishman, um, who pastored at, led a church in Chicago for many years. And if you can lead a prosperous church in Chicago, you've got something. Because I don't know, Chicago's known as a graveyard for ministries and churches. Uh, but now God's using him to, uh, as an itinerant minister to equip and train leaders. But one of the things that Ian does is that he sees some of the things in a region and identifies them so that the church can strategically deal with them. So I'm expecting when he comes in, and I'll put this demand on his gift, right, that there'll be some of that insight that he has. Um, then, you know, that we have several other gifts coming, but uh, I think someone else very strategically that the Lord is also sending us that we have scheduled for the month of November is Becca Greenwood. And uh, Becca is a spiritual daughter of Peter Wagner. Um, God's using her very much in intercession all over the world. Her in-laws actually live in the Duncan area. And we tried to get Becca here one time, and it didn't work out. Um, she was just with my friends in Japan, the church that we were a part of for many years. And uh, I connected with her, and she said, yes, I want to come. I'm looking for leaders in Oklahoma. Right? And so I believe in, in that And she was just in Washington, D.C., praying over the nation, God did some very strategic things. I saw her Facebook post this morning. She said, I've been praying for the nations. I believe that there'll be very strategic intercession that the Lord will, and strategy that the Lord will give through Becca as she comes. Amen. Now, there are other people who are coming as well, but I felt these two are, are very specific, carrying something for, strate for strategic breakthrough for us as a region as a city, and as a state. Amen. One of the words that was given to us years ago was that we would decree a thing and it would affect the state of Oklahoma. Right? So, again, that's a great word, but 
I think there's a greater faith and a greater call to all of us as an intercessory people to break through. Amen? Now, another part of that word about, about intercession and musicians, I'm going to commission you at this moment because the word of the Lord is commissioning you. But uh, Abner said, I, I, he said, I, I, see, um, I see some of the most beautiful notes, musical notes, coming out of this place. And he said, I hear beautiful sounds and sounds of heaven. And he said, um, I hear the sound, and this just challenges me so much, you guys. And I just say this with fear and trembling. I don't even want to say it. He said, I hear the sounds of 24-7 worship. Hallelujah. He said, coming out of this house. And he said, I hear these sounds going out and going out into the sounds of heaven coming into this room and coming out of this room uh, throughout all the earth. Now, that I believe that's twofold. I believe there's a great sound of intercession that God wants to release to the nations. But again, this is a word that has been given over and over and over. Um, there's a call for some of the musicians in this house to record music. Olivia knows that. She gets that word all the time, right? Many of you sitting here, you felt that. You felt that stirring, amen? Um, this must happen. This is a mandate from the Lord, right? I don't know what that looks like. I love karaoke, but that's about my limit on music, right? Um, and I'll, I remember Vivian Hibbert. Remember when Vivian was here and she prophesied to Olivia and our team that they needed to record, and she said, um, she said in her New Zealand accent, she said, your daughter, and this, I can't even do it, sound, <laughs> Sounds like a weird Australian accent. She said, your daughter has to write songs, right? She, she has to do it because they're, and this is for the whole team, there are things that have to come out of her and songs out of your team that can change the world, right? Because there are beautiful notes that God wants to bring out of this house. There are beautiful sounds there are beautiful words of intercession that God wants to release out of us that will change nations and go throughout the earth. You know why everybody is singing Bethel stuff? I love Bethel stuff. I love Upper Room stuff. But some of those places, they're capturing a sound of revival. But Bethel has captured a sound of revival because why? Revival's been in their house. Upper Room is capturing a sound of revival. And you know how they captured it? They just started having prayer sets, worship sets, daily, right? And I, when we were there a couple of years ago, one of their leaders is like, man, we just, this is shocking to us, you know. But they just began to worship, and they started in this small group, it's so funny to me. Some of us have been there. Such a, a non-seeker-friendly church in the heart of Dallas, one of the most materialistic cities in the world, a city where, you know, many churches are like, we'll have all these short services because we don't want to monopolize people's time. And you got a group that just said, no, we're just going to gather and sing the song of the Lord and we're going to intercede over our city and over our nation, and it's just beginning to transform Dallas. And I believe that Upper Room, and there are many other incredible churches there that are contending for awakening, but I believe places like Upper Room and Glory of Zion and all those places, as they're releasing those intercessory things, that it's going to ignite an awakening in Dallas. And not just Dallas. I mean, we've seen some of those visions and things of how that will, will come throughout the state, and we, we're in a key place to see that revival ignited. Amen. Hallelujah. So worship and intercession. And, and part of the word from Abner was, if, if you'll start, let me find it here. Um, 
Basically, he said, if you'll just begin and you'll build small in times of prayer and worship, that he would e- God would even begin to bring intercessors from the nations. And that a sign of breakthrough, <laughs> it would be a big breakthrough, would be 24-7 worship and prayer out of this place. Right? Hallelujah. And it's scary to say this because we've tried to birth that before. And a great hurt came out of it. Right? Great destruction actually came out of it when we tried to birth that before. So, because the devil doesn't want that. Right? Another word was that you are moving in, he said, I see this body moving in unity as never before. Right? He said, I hear a song of unity that's coming forth in his place. And he said, you must declare continually, this will be a body of unity. Right? He said, this will be a body of purpose. This will be a body of advancement. And this will be a body of prophets. And so we must declare that this will be a body of unity. Ephesians 4.3 says that we are being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Did you know unity takes diligence? It does. It takes diligence. You ever had a family that wasn't united? Right, we just all came out of Christmas. We can probably all say yes to that. Right? It takes diligence, right? And so, but the word of the Lord is that this body must be united, right? We, why, why is one of the issues with our government right now, no matter what your political leanings, but our government is so, so in disunity at this moment. It's, it's horrible, right? And I'm not picking on sides, right? It's a, it's a terrible thing happening in our government, and so, hallelujah. But we must move in unity as, ever, as never before. We are called, another thing Abner said, to be a multi-generational house. And this can't just be a church of only young people. And it can't just be a church of old people. Right? We're to be a multi-generational house of fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. Right? We need every generation. It is a all-hands-on-deck movement and moment in the body of Christ. And he said that this will be a multi-general house, multi-generational house and a gathering place for the nations of the earth. Right? One of the things that the Lord showed us was that, uh, you know, people from the nations, missionaries, they would come and get refreshed, that other ministers would come and get refreshed and strengthened. I mean, we're starting to see that. Amen. You guys always don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but in the last days and weeks, people are coming to get ministry. People are coming to get encouraged. People are coming to get strengthened. Amen. Amen. And so that's something that God has further said what would happen, and it's further beginning to happen, and I think it's just going to continue. Amen. That people will come not only because of the river and the oil and the fire and the glory, right, but they'll also come to get refreshed, to rest, to get delivered, and to get healed. Amen. He said, I see a release of revival fire going through this place and the people here. Amen. So I, th- those are some of the things that he said. And one of the other things he said was that, you know, he said, although you guys have aligned with people and you've, you've drawn from many streams, he said, there's a unique way of birthing that God wants to give us as a church. Right, We can't just say, well, we want to be like this church, or we, we want to be like this group, or we want to be, be like this, because there has to be something unique that happens if we're going to break through in this region. right? And God, I believe, is giving us the blueprints to do that. Amen. He also said that we must guard the vision. We must guard what God has given us. If we don't guard properly what the Lord is saying, 
then we can't birth what he wants to do, right? And, you know, God's doing a lot of good things right now, but we're still very much in a birthing stage, right? And so we very much have to guard what the Lord is doing and what he's saying. And then ultimately, one of the last things Abner said is that God is pleased. Amen. God's pleased with what's being produced here, right? He's pleased with you guys. He's pleased with what's happening. Isn't it good to know that the Lord's pleased? Aren't you glad? Yes. Sometimes, sometimes you feel like God isn't pleased. <laughs> we all have those moments, but the Lord is doing something. But I believe as we head into this year, and I just wanted to further put those things out there. Many of these things we know. People have prophesied. People have spoken to myself and Jamie and other leaders and other prophets and apostles and as they've come in. But we, as the body of Christ in this local expression, we must lay a hold of these things at a new level. Amen. There is a call to contend for the vision. There is a call to guard the vision. And you guys, I understand life happens, right? I've got a whole lot of life going on right now, right? We all have that, right? But there, there's something, if... if if God wants to give us a unique blueprint, he's calling a family. He's calling an army, right? All those different expressions in this place to see us break through, to see the glory of God come and begin to transform a city. Now, are we seeing some good fruit? Yes, but there's more. So this morning, I want us to have a time of communion together. And as we have this time of communion together, understand that uh, I love doing communion because there's just such a grace in communion to receive what the Lord wants to give to us. Amen. As we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and not only his death, but his resurrection and his ascension, his body and his blood, there's something that we can receive from him, whether you need physical healing, whether you need to be set free, whether you need grace to overcome perhaps an issue in your life, this is a table of grace that we can all partake of today. Amen. So I just want to read out of 1 Corinthians 11, verses, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in as, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Father, today, I want to thank you Lord, we're in a moment of destiny, and Lord, we need grace. Father, we need grace at this moment. We need grace to overcome. We need grace to move forward. Holy Spirit, we need your grace in our lives individually so that we can move into the breakthrough, the freedom, everything that you have for us as an individual, as a family, and as a local body, Father, we thank you for the, the body of Jesus. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that, a, that atonement has come, that we've been delivered from sin, that we've been delivered from sickness, disease, infirmity, poverty. Father God, we lay a hold of those things. God, I thank you that you've delivered us from the power of sin and death. And so today as we partake, Lord, I thank you that there's a grace to overcome in all these areas. But Father, there's even a grace for this new year to move forward. So Father, we bless the elements of communion. And Lord, we just honor and worship and love you, Jesus, today. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. So. As Logan puts on some music, I just invite you to come, take the elements. You can form two lines. 
uh, go back to your seat. However, you can kneel, whatever. Just don't spill your juice. All right. All right. There's still a, a no rule for anything besides communion juice and water in here. Hallelujah. And uh, <laughs> just, just pointing it out. It's holy. And, uh, uh, and partake of what the Lord's doing. Amen? So come and receive. I just think he should be bragged on a little bit once in a while. And um, so today's, today's your day. Uh, now, in, in, I want to say it was probably in December, um, Family of Faith College asked if he would teach a college course for them. <coughs> He's not even yet qualified. He has four more classes to finish before he would technically be qualified, but they want him to do it anyway, and we'll cover him under their umbrella with, with those things. But... Um, <coughs> We were so overwhelmed in the moment, and, and I think he just nearly cried because he was like, I can't. I cannot do one more thing. I can't handle it. And, and so we had a conversation, and we're like, listen, um, if you will let Dwayne and I help do some things and some other people do some things, you can totally do this. It's a great honor that they're asking you to do this. Well, then, um, so he agreed, and he's in the process of getting those things together and figuring those things out and still hasn't let us do anything else, but... He's going to do that. But, um, but this week, he got an, an email from Global Awakening, Global Awakening Ministries um, asking him to teach Level 3, Level 3 Healing um, CHCP course, which starts Monday. He said no. And... I even offered to take his English class. I tried, guys. <laughs> and I tried to, you know, but, you know, that's a lot. You know, they asked, I don't know, it was Thursday or something? It was Friday. I Friday. Think. And mm -hmm. it starts Monday. And he also, the same day, got a phone call asking if he would be a part of a team that is um, coming together to, to speak over and declare some things in, into the state of Tennessee. And so, I mean, things are happening, and he's being, I mean, we're just a tiny little town, and sometimes you don't realize people know him all over the world, you know, and things are happening, and demands are being put upon him, but again, what this sermon was about is we have to do the stuff, you know, because really, you know, I've had a couple of dreams the last few weeks. You guys have had some dreams about there's international call on his life, and, and there are so many things that he's equipped and supposed to be doing, so yeah. And he would probably never tell you all of those things, but there's a constant demand and request um, being being requested of him to come and to give and to impart and to do those things. So um, I think he's awesome. But and I want I want him to be able to do those things. That's that's the once a year brag, right? <laughs> So I want him to be able to do those things. So we have to do our things, right? So. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. So, so pray for me as I'm trying to get a syllabus, college syllabus together for an inner healing class. And uh, so it's a busy time. I will also be starting systematic theology for my master's program. Yes, I need to be blessed. Doesn't that sound horrible? So, and the professor's already told me it's going to be really hard, so praise God. So, anyway, so it's just all the time that we all get to come up and do the things that God has asked us to do and be faithful. Amen. So, so thank you for your faithfulness. And so many of you guys are doing so many things, and um, bless you. Let's just receive grace in the new year. Amen. Have a great day, and we'll see you. God bless. If you need... Prophetic ministry, prophetic team here. If you need physical healing, physical healing team here. So bless you guys. Have a great day and a great week. Amen.